Oh. No. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to our second day of the patient session of um, VTE Dublin. And I'd like to welcome Dr. Neve O'Connell, um, who's going to speak to us about antiphospholipid syndrome. Dr. Neve O'Connell is a consultant hematologist in the National Coagulation Centre, St. James's Hospital, Dublin and has taken the role of the National Haemophilia Director since early 2018. The NCC is the lead comprehensive care centre for adults in Ireland with haemophilia and related bleeding disorders, and also provides specialist diagnostic treatment services for thrombotic conditions, including obstetric and cancer-associated thrombosis. The NCC is a hub for clinical services, <coughs> research, training, education in disorders of hemostasis in an, on a national basis. And um, welcome, Dr. Neva Connell. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. Thanks, Anne Marie, and thank you, Anne, and to all uh, the patients and people who are joining you on the call today. <clears throat> I'm delighted to be part of this um, patient education meeting. Um, unfortunately, we can't all be together in one place at the moment. It's uh, that a shame because of the networking is always really enjoyable um, at meetings such as this. But I have no doubt that we will have many more in-person meetings in the future, and I'm really looking forward to those. For the moment, I think this is a great opportunity, though, for us to come together in a virtual space and for um, me to give a little bit of a background on an unusual condition called antiphospholipid syndrome, which is one of the clotting conditions that we look after in the NCC in St. James's Hospital. Um, I'm going to give a little outline of just general clotting first, just in case anybody missed any of the introductory meetings yesterday, and then I'll focus uh, a little bit on antiphospholipid syndrome. And I'm going to be really happy to take any questions you might have at the end of the talk. So please get on the chat uh, box there to Anne-Marie and send her in plenty of questions and we'll be able to deal with them at the end. So uh, just a little bit about ourselves. We uh, are a, a unit within St. James's Hospital. Um, this is a picture of our outpatient area and our reception desk. Um, so we look after mainly outpatients. We look after people with chronic health conditions to do with bleeding and clotting. Um, we sometimes see people as a day case and we have a special unit um, uh, on the floor below us uh, in order to do that. And very occasionally we look after people who are inpatients. And to do all of this work, we have a really important multidisciplinary team. So it's not just about um, any of the, for example, doctors who work in the centre, but actually it's about our whole team. Um, so we have specialist clinical and research nurses with enormous skills and experience in looking after people with clotting and bleeding problems. And we are really supported by our administrative officers, and there's two of them shown here, um, our quality and data officers to help manage our service. It's really important that I mention our laboratory, and you'll see why a little bit later when I'm talking about testing for antiphospholipid antibodies and then we have you know a number of different specialties such as physiotherapy and psychology and social work who really support us and the other thing that's really important for us is that in order to look after people with these complex conditions and these lifelong conditions which go on over such a long period of time we do have to have a really good electronic health record and we went live with a new version in October of last year so we're coming up to our first anniversary now with this system called Indice and it means that we always have information on people going right back uh, in fact our laboratory has records going back to the 1970s and you'd be surprised how often actually we have to go back and try and dig out some of those old records either to look after an individual person or maybe some members of their family so having good and long-term records is really important so uh, first of all, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, this problem, which is clots. Uh, so what we see here is we see some red blood cells and they're entangled in these uh, thread uh, like structures. Uh, and this is the fibrin strands that form a clot. So this is what's happening on a microscopic level in the blood vessels. And, and just to take it back a step, you know, clotting is a normal response, or sometimes we use the term physiological response, when there's an injury to a blood vessel. Because in the end of the day, we'd all bleed to death in a minute if we didn't have something that was going to seal off these little blood vessels that are damaged. And they're damaged in our day to day lives. So it's not just like you fall off your bike or you have an accident with the kitchen knife. In fact, actually, we get these little um, breaks in the blood vessels on a common basis all the time. And we need a system to try and stop that blood loss. 
on the left, you can see the first thing that happens is that the blood vessel squeezes tighter, so it stops um, the flow of blood through that area. And then the second thing is um, you get a plug of a blood cell called platelets that tends to stick to the hole in the blood vessel, and that's called primary hemostasis or a platelet plug, sometimes it's called. And then the third thing that happens is that you get clotting factors, which we all have in the blood, they fall like dominoes in order to produce this thread-like structure we saw on the last slide called fibrin, and that forms the firm clot that just finally seals the defect. So all of these things are happening in very quick succession when there is a little break in a blood vessel. And just to get down a little bit closer to it, I mentioned these clotting factor proteins and some of these are shown here on the slide with numbers like 9 and 8 and 10 and 5. And these are all clotting factors that are floating around in our bloodstream. But when that secondary coagulation is activated, it happens here on a blood cell called the platelet. Now, the platelet's already been involved. It's formed the platelet plug, but it also forms the surface on which all of the secondary hemostasis happens in order to create this fibrin mesh so as to stop bleeding. And the reason that I'm even mentioning any of this, because I know it's a bit complicated to try and follow it, is that the secondary phase of clotting happens on the platelet, which is a blood cell, and that the surface of these cells is made of something called phospholipid. So if we think back to our uh, secondary school science classes, you might remember that cells, which is a cell here that's a little chunk being chopped out of it, um, this, the, the surrounding wall of a cell is made of phospholipids and they're in a little bilayer it's called, so there's two layers of them, one on top of the other. And this is going to be important a little bit later on when we talk about antiphospholipid syndrome. And in our bodies we have to have a balance because on the one side, we need a way to stop the bleeding uh, so that uh, we don't, you know, expire from blood loss. Um, on the other hand, if uh, all we could do was create clots all the time, then we'd have a problem because we'd have too much clotting. And so there's really this balance between all the things on the one side that tend to promote the clot, like our clotting factor, uh, proteins in blood and like platelets, for example. And then on the other side, we have natural blood thinners or anticoagulants um, that help to balance that out. And it's really about where the balance is for any person. And the other thing that you might have heard of is that in order for a clot to form, um, three things can happen. You don't have to have all three or you might have one, you might have two or you might have all three. So things that tend to promote clotting would be changes in the vessel wall. So something happens on the inside of the vessel, it becomes damaged in some way. So for example, somebody who's had surgery to a blood vessel, that can damage the blood vessel and that can set up a clot. Or you can have changes in the pattern of the blood flow. So somebody who has a, a catheter in their blood vessel because they're in hospital having chemotherapy, for example, that can change the way the blood flows through the blood vessel and that can set up a clot. And then finally, you can have change to what's happening within the blood itself, hypercoagulability. And really, when we're talking about something like antiphospholipid syndrome, that's really what we're talking about. Ultimately, that might end up with uh, something like a deep vein thrombosis or DVT. Here's someone whose leg is swollen and red, um, and uh, some people uh, listening in might have experienced this. And the other thing that might happen is that the clot in the leg might break off, uh, enter the bloodstream and float up through the veins of the body and lodge in the lungs. And over here you can see there's an area where you're not seeing as many blood vessels on this x-ray because the person has a blood clot or pulmonary embolism in the lung. So people listening in will be very familiar, I'm sure, with these symptoms. But just in case anyone, you know, um, is wondering or, or didn't get a chance to listen to some of the talks yesterday, deep vein thrombosis is a clot which forms in one of the big veins deep within the leg and it blocks the flow of blood through that vein. You'll see the veins have valves here and sometimes you might hear that after a DVT the valves are, are damaged and that's why sometimes people can get quite a significant varicose veins. But at the time the clot happens, then typically what people report is pain in the leg. So it might even start as something not too severe, like a little cramp in the leg or, or just a feeling of discomfort. But what I've heard from people is that over the following days, usually that pain can increase quite a bit 
And at, at the end, when they come to hospital, often it is the case that they can't put their foot to the ground. That would be sort of a, a sort of a typical story that somebody might tell us. And not always, but sometimes people develop swelling of the leg as well. And then later on, if uh, the deep vein thrombosis becomes a sort of a chronic problem, people can end up with ulcers and I'll mention that again in a minute. So again, this is another picture of somebody who's got a, a clot in the thigh veins and you can see that the leg is swollen, um, uh, might even be a little bit discoloured and certainly this person will be having a lot of pain. So um, on the other hand, if uh, somebody either presents with a clot in the lung where they don't have a prior history of a clot in the leg, or maybe they have both, they might have a DVT and then have a pulmonary embolism. You can see that what we think happens is that a piece of clot travels through, uh, up through the body, up from the leg, up through the big veins of the body and comes through the heart and then lodges because the blood vessels um, in the lung become smaller and smaller and smaller as they get out towards the edge of the lung. So depending on the size of the clot, it might lodge quite close to the central part uh, of the veins or it might lodge quite a bit further out and it cuts off the blood supply to that area of lung and then that area of lung actually dies in fact or infarcts is the, is the name we sometimes use for it. And if that happens, um, the kinds of symptoms people will talk about is feeling pain in their chest, um, so it might be a central pain uh, or later on if it's causing this infarction, you might hear people talk about what we call pleuritic pain. So they get pain in the edge of their lungs and if they take a big breath in, it really catches them and is very painful. Uh, some people present with fainting actually when they've had a pulmonary embolism and when we measure their oxygen levels in the hospital, they tend to be low. And just to bear in mind that both the DVT end of the story and the pulmonary embolism end, these are all part of the one condition. And the uh, term we use for it is venous thromboembolism. It's a collective term for both DVTs and PEs. As I've mentioned, sometimes people have a DVT on their own, sometimes people have a PE on its own, and then sometimes people can have both. And one other point is that um, sometimes people say, well, you know, I've had uh, multiple clots. And so when they've um, had a test in the hospital for clots, maybe they found multiple clots in the lungs. But actually, we would consider that all one episode. So for us, it's really one episode of pulmonary embolism, no matter if you have one big clot in the middle or multiple small clots out of the edges. I, I mentioned earlier on that there are some complications. So the complications of having a DVT might be pulmonary embolism, as I've mentioned. But it can also be something called post thrombotic syndrome. And this is where the veins are damaged and the vein valves are damaged by the presence of the clot. And then as time goes on, people tend to get chronic swelling of the leg. They can get pigmentation down at the ankle. You'll often see spider veins or thread veins, varicose veins. Mm -hmm. And the difficulty with this is that you get poor circulation to the skin of the leg and then you can get an ulcer in the skin, which is shown here. And that's really a hard one to heal and can even take months to heal with, you know, dressings every couple of days and so forth. So we and want we to try and... Now that uh, Dr. Mike Watts is going to talk specifically on uh, yes. thrombotic syndrome later on. Yeah. Um, the other, I suppose, uh, big complication that's rare that we always look out for is where a leg becomes extremely swollen and it has a very unusual Latin name called phlegmasia. Um, but again, this is something that would happen at the time of the clot and we would be looking out for that in the hospital. And then the complications of pulmonary embolism are things like high blood pressure within the pulmonary vessels and pressure on the right side of the heart. So these are all things that can happen uh, when you get DVTs and PEs. And when we think about what causes venous thromboembolism, you know, many people would probably come up with all of these um, causes. So I think we can all understand how somebody who's in hospital having a major surgery or who's unfortunate to have a big accident and is hospitalized, those people are immobile and they're likely to have um, a risk for clotting. Uh, somebody who's not able to mobilise because of uh, some long-standing injury, for example. People who've got severe heart failure, people who are pregnant, people who are older. And then there are other things that we would be aware of within the hospital setting, such as people who are on oestrogen-containing medications, people who have cancer. Then there's some things that people can't 
you know, maybe completely controlled, such as maybe addiction to injected drugs. And then obviously people who um, are unfortunate to have obesity or overweight. But the one over here on the left is, is something called thrombophilia. And I suppose that's where we're going today with this talk, because we're talking about something that is intrinsic in the blood. So it's not like something that you, you get uh, in the sense of uh, having an injury or a surgery. And thrombophilia can be thought of as just a state of being. So sometimes it's it's a term that's used in terms of blood tests. But in my mind, actually, it's more a predisposition to thrombosis, somebody who has a natural underlying tendency to thrombosis. And this, of course, can have many contributing factors. So internal factors to the person, in other words, the constitution of their blood or their age or external factors like their legs in a cast or something like that. And we think of um, sometimes um, these uh, thrombophilic states as being inherited. So there's a number of inherited conditions, but these are quite uncommon. And then the second category is acquired, where you don't have it at birth or you didn't have it all through your childhood, but you get it later in life. And as antiphospholipid syndrome, which is what I really want to talk about today, is one of those acquired thrombophilias. So you're not born with it, but you get it later, usually in adult life. And what is this syndrome? Well, it, there's a classification which clearly outlines what it is. And you have to have two things. You have to have the presence of antibodies. These are um, immune proteins that we all have in our bodies that generally we tend to, to make when we're fighting infection. But sometimes we get antibodies that are directed against our own cells or our own proteins. And in antiphospholipid syndrome, these antibodies are directed against phospholipid. But it's not enough just to have those. You also should have a clot either in your veins, like a DVT or a PE, which we've just been talking about, or in your arteries, such as a stroke or a heart attack. Or there are certain problems in pregnancy that um, we can use to make a diagnosis of antiphospholipid syndrome. So we'll remember again that um, our cells are made of a phospholipid bilayer um, and the platelets that we use to stop bleeding uh, have a phospholipid wall. And antiphospholipid antibodies are directed against the phospholipid in the wall. So here's the phospholipid in the wall and here's the little antibodies. This is just a little uh, schematic of the structure of the antibodies. And funnily enough, they don't bind directly to the phospholipid wall, but they bind to a protein called beta-2 glycoprotein 1 most commonly. So it's almost like um, the beta-2 glycoprotein 1 is the, is the meat in the sandwich between the antiphospholipid antibodies on the one side and the phospholipids on the other. And you can think about thinking about our blood cell, that, or our, sorry, our blood vessel that we were looking at earlier on, floating around in the blood of people who have antiphospholipid syndrome or all these little antiphospholipid antibodies. And they're binding with the phospholipid walls of the platelets. And they're creating coagulation and clot so that you get this mesh then of the blood cells and the fibrin strands, which we saw very at the very beginning of this presentation. And that can occur here in the veins of the leg, like we've already been talking about for DVT. It can float up into the veins, uh, into the pulmonary arteries, actually, um, which is part of the venous system uh, to cause a PE, or it might even go up into the arteries of the brain and cause a stroke. So uh, that's, I suppose, how the presence of these antibodies helps to create the conditions that people get clots. And we call these antiphospholipid antibodies autoantibodies. So they are directed against our own cells and proteins. They're not made to fight infection. Uh, it's almost like a mistake. And there are a number of these different autoimmune conditions. So people might have heard of some of them. So conditions like uh, systemic lupus erythematosus or SLE, Rheumatoid arthritis is another uh, autoimmune condition, but there's lots of different autoimmune conditions. So we have autoimmune thyroid problems. We have autoimmune blood conditions such as low platelets or um, uh, hemoglobin being broken down, hemolytic anemia it's called. So there's a wide variety of these autoimmune conditions and antiphospholipid antibodies are just one of them. And thinking about other autoimmune conditions, I suppose the question might arise, is there a link with other autoimmune conditions? And the answer is there is. 
Now, some people with antiphospholipid syndrome have it on its own. There's no evidence of any other autoimmune conditions, and we call that primary APS. And then in about a third of patients approximately or so, uh, you might have secondary APS where the condition is present with another condition like systemic lupus erythematosus or rheumatoid arthritis. We know that women are more likely to have APS and that's because in general women are more likely to have all of the autoimmune conditions. But we do also have men with this condition, so it's not just confined to one or other. And finally, I mentioned that it's not an inherited condition, so it's not like it runs in families, but occasionally we have families with more than one person in the family having APS. And it might be that that family just has a predisposition to autoimmune conditions, and that's why you have more than one person in the family with APS. So that's not a very common situation, but I certainly have at least one family uh, with this uh, situation. So to diagnose these antiphospholipid antibodies, we have to do some tests in the lab. And I suppose the first thing to say is that these lab tests are hard to do and they are also hard to interpret. So um, you really need to have a lab that's very um, uh, used to doing these lab tests in order to do it properly. So the first test we do is something called a lupus anticoagulant or LA, sometimes we call it. And actually it's two tests within one. So as part of the of the lupus anticoagulant, we do two different tests and it's done in our coagulation laboratory. So we're, you know, we're taking the blood of the person and we're trying to make a clot and we're using some little um, tricks uh, to try and show whether there is or there isn't an antiphospholipid antibody present in the blood. The name is actually not a good one because it's called the lupus anticoagulant, but of course it's not an anticoagulant. It causes clotting rather than treats clotting. So that's the first thing to know. A lupus anticoagulant is actually procoagulant. And the second thing that sometimes confuses people is that just because you have a lupus anticoagulant does not mean that you have lupus. So that's very important to understand. And the second round of tests that we do, we sort of call antiphospholipid antibodies. And they're also two different tests. And these ones are done in the immunology laboratory. So there's a slightly different technique that we use in the lab to measure these. And the two different kinds that we do are anti-cardiolipid antibodies and anti-beta-2 glycoprotein-1 antibodies. And then within those two tests, there are also two different subtypes. Although we believe that the IgG antibodies are more likely to be associated with clotting. So I don't think that people need to, um, you know, remember all of this, but you might have heard some of these terms before, and that's why I think it's important that we understand it. But I think one important point to remember is that the people who have the strongest likelihood to have a clot are people who are positive in the lupus anticoagulant and also positive in anticardiolipin antibodies and anti-beta-2 glycoprotein-1 antibodies. We call this triple positive and so in effect really it means all the tests are positive and those are the people who are probably most likely to have clots and it's a little less certain if you only have a lupus anticoagulant or you only have anticardiolipin antibodies positive. What does that mean for your risk of clotting? So that's a little bit more tricky to say. And I think one thing that we all need to remember is that mm, these are not entirely uncommon, even in general people wandering around down in Dundrum shopping centre. Um, so these can be present in about 1.5% of people at any given time, um, but they tend to be temporary. So they become positive, they're temporarily positive for a short period and then they go away again. And it's probably part of our immune system's response to some random infection we might have come across, whether that be a cold, a flu, whatever. So another important thing to remember about antiphospholipid antibodies is, is that they're only relevant if they are persistently present on tests done more than 12 weeks apart. So if you have a lupus anticoagulant that's positive and you repeat it in six weeks and it's still positive, that isn't that isn't enough for us to think of you as somebody who might have antiphospholipid syndrome. It must be more than 12 weeks apart. So people who have had testing for these antibodies might have experienced <clears throat> having a positive test and then being told, well, actually, you know, we're going to have to bring you back now in 12 weeks and repeat the test. And this is the reason because they're only important if they're persistent.
And so what if you just have persistent antibodies? So we certainly have people like this where we have for some reason identified that they have a positive antiphospholipid antibody, but they have no history of clots in the leg or the lung or strokes or heart attacks and they've never had any problems in pregnancy. So really important for these people to understand this is not antiphospholipid syndrome, but I suppose it gives us a little idea that maybe um, given the right circumstances, people with these antibodies might be at risk of a clot in the future. So what we tend to do for people in this situation is we give them advice so that if they're in hospital, for example, having a major surgery or a major medical illness which confines them to bed or their legs in a cast and, and perhaps if they're pregnant also, that's a kind of an individual decision um, and they have these persistent antiphospholipid antibodies, then in those circumstances we might consider a preventative treatment with low molecular weight heparin injections which some of you might have come across in the past. So that's a preventative treatment to uh, make sure that while the person's immobilized that they don't get a clot. So if having the antibodies on their own isn't APS, what is APS? So the first thing is, as I've mentioned, you do have to have these antibodies, right? So we have to be able to measure these antibodies and persistent over a 12 week period. And any of them can be positive. So you don't need to have all of them positive. If any of them are positive uh, twice with at least 12 weeks between them, then the next thing is we have to see, have you had a history of either a clot in an artery, like a stroke or a heart attack, a clot in a vein, like a DVT or a PE, or a, an, a clot in a different blood vessel, for example, um, where we've uh, maybe done a biopsy and you've shown clots in the vessels. So clots somewhere. And then there are three different pregnancy situations, which are that you've had uh, one or more unexplained deaths of a baby after 10 weeks gestation without any other reason for that baby to have passed away. Uh, it could also be a, a premature birth before 30 weeks, sorry, before 34 weeks of pregnancy, again with um, a normal baby um, with a normal um, uh, development, but perhaps some evidence of problems in the placenta. Or three or more consecutive spontaneous miscarriages um, before 10 weeks. So um, so there's, there's quite a few scenarios there for pregnancy. I suppose one of the difficulties we often come across is we might have a lady who has two miscarriages or maybe has three miscarriages that weren't consecutive. So um, in those situations we can use our clinical judgment. So if the person has persistent antiphospholipid antibodies and a clinical situation that is consistent, we sometimes might say to that person, look, we think you have APS, even though you don't 100% fit the classification. And why it's important is that it is, it is the one condition, I think, um, which uh, is associated with clotting where we can be really kind of um, clear to somebody about how long they need to have anticoagulation. So if you've got a clot in the vein, like a DVT or a PE, and you have antiphospholipid syndrome, then we will be putting you on blood thinners for life, basically. Um, if you have a stroke, uh, or a heart attack, we generally will treat you with anticoagulation. And in some cases, we might also give you what's called an antiplatelet agent like aspirin or Plavix or something like that. And if you're pregnant with this condition, there is a high rate of pregnancy loss. And we know that if we give aspirin and preventative doses of low molecular weight heparin throughout the pregnancy and for at least six weeks after the delivery, that we can increase this, the rates of successful pregnancy from around 20% up to around 80%. So it makes a big difference um, when we give a, this treatment in pregnancy for people who have APS. And uh, just for all pregnancies, I'll just make the point that the highest risk time for clotting in pregnancy is in the six weeks after delivery. So that's something that people should really always bear in mind that um, you know, it's important, even though times are very busy when the baby's delivered and everybody's very busy at home and uh, it can be hard to remember um, and to sort of pay attention to your own health care. But actually, that is the critical time for ladies who have just delivered. So uh, I suppose the importance of APS is that if you have a confirmed diagnosis of APS, then you do have a significant risk of having another clot in the future and we need to manage that and it needs to be done by people who have expertise in this condition.
If you get a clot in the vein, and we mentioned DVTs and PEs earlier on, I've mentioned that generally we'll be recommending anticoagulation. Often, if you're in hospital, your initial treatment will be low molecular weight heparin, um, but your ongoing treatment should be with an oral agent, and that agent should be warfarin. Um, typically, we would use a target INR of a range of two to three. It's now known from a randomized control trial that had to be stopped early that the newer direct oral anticoagulants are not as effective in reducing recurrent clots in APS. In fact, in the NCC, we had never moved our APS patients to DOAX. We had always had a sort of a feeling that maybe uh, it wouldn't be the right thing to do because of the particular risks of clotting in this condition. And uh, sure enough, as more evidence became available, uh, that turned out to be true. I do have a couple of people who are on DOAX, so they have APS and for various reasons they couldn't take warfarin. So I'm not saying I would never ever use a DOAC. Clearly, if for some reason you can't have warfarin, then having a DOAC is better than not having anticoagulation at all. Um, but it is absolutely not our first choice because we feel the rate of recurrence is higher. And then just like people um, with DVTs for other reasons, um, if your leg is quite swollen and you have symptoms that are suggestive of PTS, we'll suggest one of these graduated compression stockings, um, which some of you might be familiar with. And again, as um, Anne-Marie has mentioned, probably Mike Watts will deal with that in a little more detail later on. And we know if we treat people with um, anticoagulants, it's highly effective at uh, reducing extension of the clot. In other words, we don't want the clot spreading up the leg, uh, at reducing embolization, which is where you get the break off of clots floating to the lung. It reduces recurrence of clots, absolutely, and reduce, reduces this post thrombotic syndrome. There's always a downside, I suppose, to every medication and, and the, the real downside of, of blood thinners or anticoagulants is major bleeding. Um, and this happens at a rate for all of them, to be honest, of about two to three percent per year. And if for some reason somebody has to be on long term low molecular weight heparin, then you have to contend with the added burden of the subcutaneous injections as well. But I think in particular in APS, it, it is a less difficult decision because what we're saying really is that the risk of recurrence if you were to stop anticoagulation is really very significant and much higher than your risk of major bleeding if you stay on the blood thinner. Some people who are on warfarin um, are able to undertake point of care or self-testing for their INR. Um, one of the problems with APS is these antiphospholipid antibodies can interfere with our INR test because phospholipid is part of our test. It has to be because it's part of coagulation. So we always have to have phospholipid in the system to do an INR test. It can actually be an issue for a small number of people, even for lab tests and sometimes also for the point of care device. So in general, we would not be recommending point of care testing for people with APS. But, you know, again, where people are having problems trying to attend for uh, hospital based INR testing, um, it can be considered, but we have to do three separate correlations, we call it, where we do a point of care test and a lab INR at the same time. And they have to be within certain parameters for us to feel it would be safe to dose based on an INR that you generate from your self testing machine. So I've certainly had a number of people with APS coming through and we've done the correlation testing and for some it's worked and they've been able to self test and for others, unfortunately, we've had to say, sorry, it's just not going to be accurate enough to dose your warfarin. Um, so uh, it's not number one option, but it can be considered and then only if your correlations between lab and point of care are good. So long term anticoagulation, you know, it's a, it's a bit of a deal, you know, for people and it's all very well, you know, to say I'll, I'm going to take my warfarin every day and get my INR checked, but things happen over time and these are lifelong conditions. So um, people are concerned about um, stopping warfarin. And I've mentioned that we feel that there's a high risk of recurrence if you do come off your anticoagulation. So in those circumstances, this is a condition where we would really want to use bridging anticoagulation. And what that means is that when we stop warfarin temporarily, <clears throat> that you'd have low molecular weight heparin injections for a few days before and a number of days after a planned procedure. And just to let you know, for APS patients, sort of a typical schedule that I might prescribe would be 
If I know someone's having a procedure on a particular day, I'd stop the warfarin five days in advance. We generally start the full treatment dose heparins about three days in advance. The last dose of low molecular weight heparin 24 hours before the procedure. And then we'd restart low molecular weight heparin and warfarin about 24 hours post procedure for something minor like a scope or something like that. But if it was a more major uh, surgery, we might be waiting 48 or even sometimes 72 hours and because we don't want to go in too early either because that will cause bleeding after your surgery. So it's a, so it's a little bit of a juggle uh, and it does have to bear in mind the person's procedure and what they're actually having done. But that's just a kind of a rule of thumb for people who, who have APS and need to stop. You might wonder if this is an immune condition, can we just suppress the immune system? Um, there are lots of immunosuppressive medicines. Um, there are, of course, risks with these as well as benefits. So suppressing your immune system, we can't unfortunately go in there and just suppress the antiphospholipid antibodies. So you might be suppressing a lot of other things that are important. Um, it's considered often if there's a secondary APS, so somebody who's got lupus or somebody who's got rheumatoid arthritis. And occasionally in the more complex APS patients, we might add a medicine. The, the most common one I've seen used is hydroxychloroquine, um, but there are plenty of others. And in general, in those ones, I would be talking to my colleagues in rheumatology um, so that we are doing things in a planned way together um, rather than um, you know, maybe just one doctor on their own. So this is such a complicated um, situation and condition that often it is necessary to have more than one specialist involved in the decision making. So I mentioned uh, long term anticoagulation is a sort of the general advice. Sometimes people with APS can have a provoked event, so maybe like that they have their leg in a cast and they get a clot, perhaps they for whatever reason didn't get preventative anticoagulation. Um, it is sometimes considered to stop anticoagulation in APS patient with a very obvious provoked event where the provoking risk factor is now gone. So it is possible to consider that, but I would actually say that in my experience, that's a very rare occurrence and more typically people do not have such a clear provoking risk factor. And then um, uh, the advice is generally for long term anticoagulation. So it's just in case anybody hears about people with APS stopping anticoagulation, that might be the scenario. There's one uh, particular complication of APS that's important to at least be aware of, but um, it's quite rare, so I wouldn't want people to feel this is a, a common event, but it's called catastrophic APS or CAPS. And effectively what there is, is widespread clotting in small blood vessels and it leads to uh, failure of the organs. So you might have, for example, uh, renal or kidney failure. You might have problems with your heart. You might have strokes. Um, it's a very, very um, serious condition. Um, it requires not alone blood thinning, but also uh, exchange of the plasma to remove those antiphospholipid antibodies temporarily and suppression of the immune system. These folks are, are usually in a kind of a critical care or ICU setting um, and it's just uh, one to be aware of that it can happen. It's, it's a very serious condition and it has a high mortality, often between 20 and even up to 50% of people might actually pass away because of this condition. So this is one that is uh, just to be aware of, um, but not, not common as I say. I suppose uh, one thing in the current climate that people might be concerned about is uh, the link potentially between COVID-19 infection and antiphospholipid antibodies. So there have been some reports of positive antiphospholipid antibodies and either arterial or venous clotting in people who are being treated for COVID-19. Um, I would just point out that typically there's only just been one test um, when these are reported. So remember I said that it's important that these antibodies are shown to be persistent. So um, in the COVID cases I've seen so far, they've tended to just be one off. And of course, um, very often people have other risk factors for clotting. So they, if they have a stroke, maybe they've also got hypertension and diabetes and, and other risk factors. And then finally, of course, we know that COVID-19 uh, is a condition that leads itself to clotting both in the lung blood vessels and also uh, because of immobility in the leg blood vessels. So I don't think we can be uh, certain that, uh, and I certainly do not personally believe that COVID-19 is causing uh, antiphospholipid syndrome, um, but uh, I think COVID-19 is a condition where there is a significant risk of clotting and that's something that everybody who's admitted to hospital should be aware of. Although a big NB here is that most people with COVID-19 have a mild condition and are not in hospital and don't need to be worried about it. <laughs>
I suppose another question that might come up is that people with APS might feel that they're more at risk if they get COVID. Um, so there's no evidence, in fact, that that is the case, although the numbers of this would be small at the moment. But I would say that we should all uh, pay uh, absolute attention to reducing our social contacts, hand washing um, and, um, you know, generally doing the things that the public health people are uh, recommending, because I don't think any of us should be um, really uh, trying to get COVID. I think it's, it's a really um, nasty infection in a small number of people, so it's probably best avoided if we can. And just on a positive side, there is some evidence that if you're already on a blood thinner when, when you're admitted to critical care with COVID-19, that that can be protective for thrombosis. So it shows that actually anticoagulation works um, to prevent thrombosis in these people. So I suppose uh, just briefly, uh, my take home messages are that APS is not common, uh, but it is important. It's an immune condition which predisposes to clots in the arteries and the veins and pregnancy problems. It can be primary APS where it exists on its own with no other conditions or secondary APS where it's linked to other autoimmune conditions. The correct diagnosis is tricky, but it's important that we get it right. So, you know, I think it is important that the diagnosis is uh, determined by people with expertise in the area. If you are unlucky to have APS and have a clot, um, then you should have long term anticoagulation for the most part and that long term anticoagulation for the most part should be warfarin. If you're pregnant, then we have a clear plan that works um, around giving preventative doses of heparin and aspirin. And you'll have probably seen as I've been going through this whole presentation that it's more than just haematology involved here. We absolutely need our lab specialists because the lab tests are tricky. We need our obstetrical colleagues for our pregnant ladies with APS and we certainly uh, often need our rheumatology colleagues and other uh, colleagues, for example, renal physicians, ICU and so on. And um, so really this is a condition that crosses a number of different specialties. Um, there are some resources uh, for just VTE, of course, uh, there's your own uh, organisation, um, but there's also an organisation called Hughes Syndrome in the UK because the old name for APS was Hughes Syndrome. Um, and there's also some particular information about APS on that website. Uh, I want to say a big thank you to all of our patients uh, in Ireland attending the NCC and elsewhere who uh, are just a fantastic group of people to work with. Um, we've a brilliant partnership with, with our patients in the NCC and it's always been an absolute joy and pleasure to, to work with you all to improve things. And, and with that in mind, you know, we're always open to any ideas, thoughts or suggestions you have to improve our care. Um, I'd also just like to mention our own multidisciplinary team in the NCC because as I've mentioned uh, there's absolutely no way that we can look after people with these complex conditions without everybody on board. Um, I particularly have a few pictures here of our lab team because they are so critical to us when we're trying to figure out these tricky antiphospholipid antibodies. Um, and then there's a, there's a few familiar faces here from your own organisation uh, in the NCC team. So with that I'd like to finish and, and thank you all for your attention and I'm extremely happy to answer any questions people might have. Thank you, Thank so, you much. so much. It was really excellent. Really and I hope, and I hope God, there's God, an excellent, excellent one. Right. Right. Can you hear me OK? okay? Uh, yes. Hopefully it will stop. Um, so we have a few questions coming in. Uh, we have one, I you may have covered it, but we, I'll just read it anyway. Good morning. Wondering if there's any evidence of dabigatran type drug being successful in patients with APS instead of warfarin. So this is such an important point and I think, you know, we all understand what the potential benefits for people are for the newer direct oral anticoagulants, the likes of Depigatran, the likes of Apixaban or Eliquis, um, Xarelto or Rivaroxaban, Lixian or Adoxaban, and these have all been very useful to us in managing DVTs and PEs. Unfortunately, in APS, just in APS, we have, um, I think, convincing evidence that it is not sufficient to give the new direct oral anticoagulants for APS patients. So APS patients should really be only treated with low molecular weight heparin, unfractionated heparin if they're in hospital, or warfarin as an oral agent. 
Um, I, I think it's disappointing, obviously, but uh, the, the evidence is reasonably clear. Uh, so I think I think one of the things to remember is that warfarin and heparin, um, they gig, cause their effect on different parts of the coagulation cascade, whereas the newer ones, they just focus on one particular part. So I think that warfarin and heparin have wider effects than, say, the direct. They're not the same medicines. OK, better safe than sorry, I think. And that's very clear. Thank you, Niamh. Um, Should I get my children and my sister to get tested? Um, I have mild APS, but my sister has Crohn's. So I mentioned already that it's not inherited in the way that, um, you know, certain inherited diseases like cystic fibrosis might be running in families or whatever. We occasionally have families where more than one person in the family has it, but that's quite an unusual situation. So my own advice would be, you know, I don't think it's a good idea to screen for these. They're common already. Many of us already have them temporarily and you could end up on a merry-go-round um, of, um, you know, positive tests and then having to repeat them 12 weeks later and then they're maybe they're borderline and then you repeat them again. So I think you just end up causing more stress uh, and worry actually. Uh, however, if somebody in the family did have a clot, and obviously Crohn's disease in and of itself can be a risk factor for clotting, if the person had a clot then that's the point at which I might test them because okay. that would then influence what, what um, blood thinner you chose. Okay, how often uh, should my iron ore be done if I have APS? So um, there isn't any recommended uh, interval. Um, most uh, warfarin or anticoagulation clinics will have uh, an algorithm where they allow an extended interval if you're very stable. So for people who have very stable INRs, what typically happens is that they gradually increase the interval between tests. So you might go from two weekly to three weekly to four weekly, maybe six weekly. And at least in my own clinic, 12 weeks is the maximum. So we would never go longer than 12 weeks. And even then, 10 to 12 weeks is pretty rare. The average interval in the James's clinic would be every three weeks. If you happen to be somebody with APS who can self-test, then we wouldn't do it any less than monthly. That's to make sure that people maintain their skill sets in doing the testing. And of course, if you are out of range or you're on an antibiotic or you start a new medicine or you change your brand of warfarin, these are all times when you might need to do more frequent INR testing. So I would say that there isn't a kind of a set interval. Um, on average, it's monthly. It's longer for some people who are very stable and it might be shorter if you have something that is uh, going to cause instability. Um, listening to your talk, I realise um, how complicated APS is. Um, I am managed by my GP in a country practice. Um, should should I really be managed by uh, the likes of the NCC or one of the other bigger hospital clinics? Um, well, I, th I think it is a, a difficult condition. Uh, I think that it's a lifelong condition. Once you have it, you have it. And then over time, things can develop. So I suppose there's two options. One is that you seek a, an onward referral now just to, I mean, it's no harm ever to have a second opinion or someone to have a look at your situation and 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 review. And, and it can be a useful thing for anybody on long-term anticoagulation to do, to say, look, do I still need it? Am I on the right agent? Is there anything new that's arisen in recent years that would change the decision-making for me? So that's one option. And then the second option is say, look, I'm well controlled at the moment. I'm on my warfarin, I'm fine. But if something were to happen, then I'll seek an onward referral. So I think both of those options are, are open to you. OK, and um, final question. My iron ore is not very stable. Is that something that's unusual with APS? That's not unusual? Mm. Um, you know, uh, stability or instability, it's a, it's a funny one with warfarin. You know, I, I, nobody knows why this person over here is really stable and can have their checks done every 10 weeks. And then the person next to them, unfortunately, is having to come in every week or every two weeks. So very often it's not that easy for us to understand that. In my experience, um, people who have a higher target INR tend to be more unstable. People who um, are on a lot of antibiotics over the winter months, for example, there can be sometimes reasons like that for instability. 
Um, I think it's important that people take their warfarin at the same time every day. So taking it in the evening is really important. Um, taking regular meals, um, not changing your diet too much from day to day. So having, you know, you can eat vegetables, but just, you know, kind of a steady in intake is so important. It's more, it's more the warfarin, it's more the treatment issue of the unstable INO rather than the actual yes. antiphospholipid. Yeah. Now, very occasionally we have the um, antiphospholipid antibodies interfering with the test so that is a possibility with APS and that's the it, it, that is probably kind of less likely the the first things I mentioned are probably more likely to be causing the instability um, but again you know um, have a chat to the person monitoring your INR uh, whether that's your GP or a clinic and just see if they could have a look at it with you and see if there's any little um, adjustments that you guys could make um, to try and sort of increase the stability. But some people just are unlucky and they end up with a lot of testing. OK, that's fantastic. There's no more questions. We really appreciate you coming and talking to us today. Thank you so much, Dr. Neva O'Connell. That's fantastic. Thanks a lot. Stay on the line.